Okay, chapter 18, uh, we're looking at imperialism and America. Uh, Americans, of course, had always sought to expand the size of their nation. And throughout the 19th century, they extended their control toward the Pacific Ocean. Uh, that was called Manifest Destiny. However, by the 1880s, many American leaders had become convinced that the United States should join the imperialist powers of Europe and establish colonies overseas. And so that brings us to imperialism. And so we want to take a look at then what is the policy of imperialism. Uh, quite simply put, it's where a stronger nation extends its economy, its uh, political affairs and military control over weaker territories. Uh, when, you, when you think about uh, the picture down below, uh, that's England, and England kind of has its hand in a lot of different areas around the world. Uh, sometimes said that the sun never sets on the British Empire. Uh, think back to the American colonies. When England controlled its economy, it, uh, it controlled its political affairs, um, and, and also finally used its military to try to keep them in line. And of course, America didn't like that. And from that time of independence and beyond, the, usually the, the idea in America was they didn't like imperialism or the idea of expanding, kind of like England had done. But by the 1880s, again, this is already kind of a strong trend with a lot of other European nations. And everybody kind of feels like that if they don't get in the fray, they're going to be left behind. So what were the, the major factors that contributed to the growth of American imperialism? There are really four. So we'll take a look at a look at these. One, of course, is global competition. As I mentioned, a lot of other countries were already starting to do this. And uh, at the time, roughly around the 1880s and, and a little bit after, nation, you're going to see nations starting to compete for Africa as well as Asia and, and China in particular. And we'll talk more about China down the road. Uh, and others, and some Pacific Islands. Um, uh, let me get these pictures on right away. The the picture on the top right kind of gives you the idea of of in a, right right around this time you had these these European nations that were kind of at this tug of war with with Africa, and so they finally sit down and they carve up Africa pretty much into the countries that you have today. A lot of them have changed or have gained independence various times. Um, but that's that's when that happened. That's that's when the map of Africa was kind of carved out, and it looked as if that was going to happen in China as well. And again, this global competition, most countries hoped that that would bolster industrialization within their own countries. And of course, the United States is is not immune to that. And then you have that desire for military strength. Other nations had a military presence around the globe, such as England and France and Germany and, and even Japan. Um, that if you had a colony, it could easily be taken over by somebody else's military if you didn't have a military presence there too. And so that desire for military strength was you're going to need to build up uh, to keep those, those nations away from you. And that's really kind of the idea behind the book by Alfred Mahan. That's uh, the bottom uh, right there, uh, the influence of sea power upon history. And, and in that book, he really kind of lays out the idea that the country with the strongest and biggest navy pretty much controls the world. By the way, he's a good buddy of Teddy Roosevelt's. A third is that thirst for new markets. Uh, there was the feeling in the United States that if we didn't expand, we were going to explode as far as markets were concerned. Um, Foreign trade literally seemed like the answer for the overproduction in the United States. Remember, keep in mind what's going on in the United States. Think of our the video, uh, the men who built America that we've been watching. You know, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, um, the Vanderbilts. There's a lot of production going on, of a lot of different things. And it was almost like we need to go somewhere else with it. And these foreign markets seemed like the answer. And finally, there's this belief in cultural superiority. The United States um, had this, this belief that we had a responsibility to not only 
civilize, but also to Christianize. Um, and so that, that, that book by Josiah Strong that I just popped up, Our Country, Its Possible Future and Its Present Crisis, focused on that. The, the idea that we needed to, to, to help those people who didn't know God. Um, and then there's the philosophy of social Darwinism. Uh, the idea that uh, the free market competition would lead to the survival of the fittest. And people took that as if our nation wasn't ready to compete and be the strongest country out there, we would be swallowed up by a lot of others. And, and so uh, people like Teddy Roosevelt really strongly believed this idea. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, a good friend of his, really believed in this idea. And as a result, they looked to try to um, not only increase markets for our industry, but also to build our military so that we could protect it, not just here in America, but around the world. In the, the second part of section one, uh, we'll look at how the United States acquires Alaska. And notice we don't acquire Hawaii, we kind of take Hawaii. And so what what's really uh, significant about the purchase of Alaska. This is really kind of an interesting one, and it goes back a ways, 1867. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's just this vast, huge, huge land um, that most Americans really had no idea. That they just knew it was owned by, by uh, Russia. Um, but it was a land that was just extremely rich in timber, a major, you know, just a major natural resource and minerals. And then assuming minerals they didn't even know of yet. And of course, one that they really didn't know yet, but probably one of the largest oil reserves in American history will be found there then as well. Uh, and so the arrangement is by William Seward. Seward, of course, if you remember a few chapters back, he was the Secretary of State under um, Abraham Lincoln and then would assume that position um, with William Seward. Uh, so in 1867, he, if you look at the picture in uh, the top, top right, you've got uh, Sar Nicholas uh, kind of showing, um, trying to sell his, the, the pitch uh, to Seward that uh, you're getting a great place. But in, to most Americans, it looked like nothing but this, this frozen tundra. Um, and so they, they saw that then as, as kind of a folly. Why, why would anybody pay $7.2 million for, for snow and polar bears? Um, uh, they, it, it doesn't get statehood, of course, until 1959. And of course, the reason for that is it, its population doesn't really grow significantly. Um, and so finally, the United States in 1959 just kind of takes Hawaii and, and Alaska together. So this is Seward's Folly, Seward's Icebox, it's sometimes referred to. Um, William Seward, that's his picture, profile of him. And then of course, Alaska, how close Alaska is to uh, to Russia. Russia needed to kind of dump it. it they, they had to get rid of it because they feared if they were in some political turmoil with England, that uh, if, if England ends up winning uh, this little feud that they had, they might have to give it to England and that would only make Canada much more powerful and put England closer to Alaska. And so uh, Russia sees the United States as, as a better option to sell this to. Plus they were kind of, their, their relationship was, was kind of strong um, during and, and shortly after the, the Civil War. Uh, when we look at the taking of Hawaii, uh, there are some groups that were interested in increasing America's presence in Hawaii, and, and, and we'll look at why in the second point there. But uh, it really, all, it starts back with American missionaries, way back in almost the 1820s to 1840s. Uh, whalers from New England, uh, told kind of the Puritan um, congregationalists in, in the New England states, to, and that uh, there was this island that they would kind of, uh, you know, go to to kind of get you know rest and resupply that uh, didn't have God and, and these natives there were you know you know heathens and so the missionary societies in the New England states <laughs> you know sent a few missionaries out there and eventually these missionaries you know after a couple of generations uh, these missionaries end up buying a lot of the land in Hawaii and become some pretty powerful sugar planters uh, pineapple and fruit growers 
uh, and, and they become somewhat influential. And you now why do they want an American presence there? Well, this is also during a time of the McKinley Tariff, which was the highest peacetime tariff ever. Well, since they didn't have an association with the United States, they had to pay that tariff. Now, if they become annexed to the United States, they don't pay that tariff then. Uh, and so they, that's the reason they want that American presence in Hawaii. It's, it's very, you know, economy minded. So how did Hawaii eventually come under the control of the United States? Well, it, it kind of, we're going to have to kind of go back and look at King Kalakaua. Um, that's the, the guy um, standing just to the, the right of the screen there. Uh, next to his sister, actually, that's Queen Lily. Um, her name's really much longer and uh, than her brother's, and so I can't pronounce it. Uh, but anyway, what he ends up doing is granting voting rights to wealthy landowners who happen to be these white landowners, these former missionaries, now, now landowners. And with that, that helps them or gives them a say as to, you know, all kinds of policy for Hawaii. Well, when his sister, Queen Lily, comes to power, uh, it, it pretty much looks like she's going to kind of restore Hawaii back to Hawaiians, which means that those voting rights to white landowners uh, might end. And so these white landowners kind of organize a revolt against Queen Lily's um, government. And with the help of, of course, the U.S. Navy is stationed there. And with the help of the U.S. Navy, this revolt is successful. And so these white landowners will then set up a government headed by uh, Sanford Dole. Remember the Dole pineapples and things like that? Well, that, that's him. That's the family. Um, there he is taking his uh, oath of office as the head of Hawaii now. And so he quickly sends uh, annexation desire to the United States, but President Cleveland's kind of kind of smells a rat here, and he's going to send some investigators over to Hawaii, yeah, talk about a tough job, uh, to kind of investigate what happened there. How did we go from Queen Lily to Sanford Dole all of a sudden? Uh, and when he what he finds out is that they kind of staged this coup, and uh, the Hawaiian people really didn't want that to happen. And so he sends word that those landowners need to restore Queen Lily uh, as the head of the government again, and they need to step down. And then he also refuses annexation. Um, interestingly, uh, those white, the government headed by Dole doesn't back down, doesn't give it, turn it over to Queen Lily anymore. Uh, what happens is you're, you're still, it's still, you know, the Civil War is still too fresh in everybody's mind. And it would have been as it, for him to finally force this, Cleveland to force this, he would have had to send troops over to kind of help Queen Lily. Well, that would kind of seemed a lot like Civil War and it, and it one of, of, of war of brother against brother. Um, finally, 1898, uh, President McKinley, who's in favor of expansion and imperialism, uh, also favors this annexation. And in 1898, of course, we go to war with Spain and it becomes very obvious that the Hawaiian Islands are pretty important as a military base, uh, naval base. And so uh, the United States quickly annexes uh, Hawaii and it becomes a U.S. territory. 